which box do I check? I recently wrestled with this question as I filled out the United States Census. Black, white, and now they recently added white non-Hispanic, which is interesting to me because I didn't see Asian non-Hispanic or black non-Hispanic. And what do those boxes do for me anyway? How do they define me? What if, like many first-generation Americans, born of immigrant parents, none of those boxes define me at all? A colleague recently asked, so what do I call someone like you? You know, someone of Spanish background. Is the proper term Latina, or is it Hispanic, or is it Spanish? Let me take this opportunity to clarify a very common point of confusion, even among Spanish speakers. The term Spanish refers to someone who was actually born in the country of Spain. So automatically calling anyone who speaks Spanish, Spanish, is akin to calling anyone who speaks English, British or English. That should be simple enough. Here's where it gets confusing. The term Latina or Latino or the gender neutral Latinx and some pronounce it Latinx refers to someone of Latin American or Central American background, which begs the question, where does this leave the Caribbean? My family is Cuban. Some would call us Latino, but you wouldn't call a Jamaican Latino. Okay. What about the term my mother abhorrently refers to as the H word? The term Hispanic was actually introduced by the Nixon administration for the 1970 census. It sought to put an umbrella over everyone that spoke Spanish in the Caribbean and Latin America. Well, great, that covers Cubans, but not Brazilians who are in Latin America but do not speak Spanish. Their language is Portuguese. So they would be Latino but not Hispanic. Confused yet? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it, many people are. So many people prefer to identify with their country of origin. Colombian-American, Mexican-American, some would call me Cuban-American, but that, I feel, would be more appropriate for my mother, who was actually born in Cuba, came to America when she was seven as a Cuban exile. She grew up in, was educated in, and became a citizen in the United States. Why can't I simply be American? That was the burning question. When I was growing up, listening to rock and roll, playing the Eagles on my guitar, obsessively watching MTV, and turning my nose at my parents' salsa merengue music. I considered myself as American as apple pie, uh, though I do prefer my grandmother's Cuban flan. Sorry. But the problem was that when I was growing up, no one on American TV or radio looked like me. The women celebrated in the videos always had long, feathery blonde hair, light eyes, and skinny hips. That was the symbol of beauty. Even in Latin America, the Telemundo soap opera stars also look like this, white being deified. My great-grandmother was black. I inherited her curly hair and her voluptuous curves. Things I was told as a child were curses. I would hear whispers among my family. She's such a cute girl. Too bad she was born with pelo malo, like a disease, bad hair. But pelo malo really means black people hair, hair indicative of our African roots. Girls who looked like me when I was growing up were going through painful measures to actually iron the kink out of their hair. We were starving ourselves in an attempt to lose our curves. I would get snapped at, don't eat that cookie. It's only gonna make your big butt even bigger. I was 12. And I constantly felt ugly. And like I didn't belong anywhere. Not really black, not really white, not really Cuban, and apparently not American enough. 
Oh, my family would proudly argue, tu eres cubana, you're Cuban. But when I identify this way with someone who actually just came from Cuba and they say, oh, what part of Cuba are you from? And I say, oh, I've never actually been to Cuba. <laughs> then they say, tu no eres cubana, tu eres americana. You're not Cuban, you're American. Can't seem to find the answer that pleases everyone. When I was 17 years old, my first week at New York University, I met this New Yorican boy who wore his culture like a badge of honor. And he asked me, so what are you? I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Miami. He said, ah, so you're Cuban. <laughs> I said, well, no, I mean, my parents were born in Cuba, but I'm American. He said, typical Miami Cuban girl, huh? Always trying to pass as white. I said, uh, but I am white? He said, no, you're not. You're Hispanic. I said, Hispanic is not a color. It's not even a race. To which he replied, girl, why are you trying to deny your roots? We agreed to disagree. I wasn't trying to deny my roots, but he didn't ask me about my roots. He asked me where I was from. I'm from the United States of America. It became a question of identity. He wanted to put me in his identity box. I refused to be boxed in. I was independent for the first time in my life in New York City. I wanted to be seen for me, for my likes and dislikes, my talents, my skills. And besides, as an NYU drama major, the last thing you want is to be typecast. <laughs> One of the most basic human needs, as evidenced by watching young children at play, is the need to be seen, and seen for our accomplishments. Just watch kids playing. They're not concerned about skin color, or accents, or what their hair looks like. Look, Mom, look what I can do. Look what I can do. We want to be seen for our actions. The only box children are concerned with is the sandbox. It's later, as we start to grow and we start to absorb the views and the prejudices of those around us, of TV and media, that we start to box people in, and ourselves, accepting limiting beliefs. Oh, we box ourselves in all the time, and not just based on things like heritage, but things like our age, our gender, even our body types. Think about it. How many boxes do you put yourself in? My paternal grandmother, Lilia Rosa Gandul, was a woman who defied the boxes. She came from Cuba as someone who was fleeing from tyranny, leaving everything she knew behind, exiled. She came to America with nothing, nothing but her babies in hand, not even a formal education. But what she did have was a strong vision for herself and her family. And she was not about to accept limiting beliefs, not as a woman and not as an immigrant. Instead, she went on to create and operate several successful businesses. She will always be a testament to me of what you can do when you refuse to let yourself get boxed in. You create your story. But I get it. As Americans, we're sold on the boxes, told what to think, obsessed with labels. Why? Because they're shortcuts to thinking, because it's easier. It's easier to box somebody in than to dig deep and really get to know them. Easier to buy into prefabricated stories, to make snap judgments. We do it all the time. According to Forbes magazine, Within the first seven seconds of meeting, people will have formed a solid impression of who you are. Seven seconds? 
a more recent series of studies by Princeton psychologists reveal that all it takes is a tenth of a second to form an impression of a stranger from their face. A tenth of a second? Holy cow! So that means that you see this, and within a tenth of a second, you have told yourself a story. But what if we could retrain our brains not to do this? How do we do that, Mitch? Great question. The first step to changing any automatic behavior is to bring awareness to it, to the instant it's happening. Now, I've been practicing this for some time, and I can tell you it's not easy. But whenever I find myself in a situation where I'm making a snap judgment, I will stop, catch myself, and identify, huh? You're judging. Then the next step is to tell yourself, I don't really know this person's story or the underlying reasons behind what they do. Just consider that there's more to know. That's a powerful first step. Now, as the years went on, I grew to embrace my culture's curls and curves. Celia Cruz, hey, Kimbara, the Afro-Cuban queen of salsa, went from being my parents' music to my music as well. I still love my rock and roll, but I found a place for both in my life. And yet, there's still the question, which box do I check? I want to check, rather not say. But then I hear my college friend in my ear, girl, still trying to deny your roots? <laughs> but it's not that. The truth is that like many first-generation Americans, I am many and none of those boxes. Perhaps it's time to get rid of the boxes altogether. Let people be who they are, not where they are from, or where their families have been, and definitely not the color of their skin. What if instead we see them for things like how they treat people around them? How gracefully or not they deal with adversity? See them for their true accomplishments. What if instead of asking, so what are you? We asked, what's your story? The prejudices that come with boxing people in will only dissolve if we continue to share our unique stories, continue to educate those who want to learn. Unfortunately, not everybody will want to learn. Not everybody wants to see a different point of view. To some people, admitting error is terrifying. Being right is so tied in with their identity. Often when I'm coaching my executive clients, I'll ask this question. Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? The smart leaders always answer, effective. The only way we will be effective and influence some positive changes in our society is not by focusing on those who are too closed off to learn anything, but focus instead on those who do seek to understand. The flip side of this is, don't be afraid to be wrong and admit when you're wrong. Don't be afraid to ask a question that you fear might sound stupid. Who cares? If sounding stupid leads you to greater wisdom and understanding, isn't it worth the temporary embarrassment? I mean, it's like yoga. Sometimes you have to fall on your face a couple of times before you master a new pose, right? Eventually you get it. So I want to invite you to do two things. One, dig deeper. Stop boxing people in. Instead, ask meaningful questions. Have diverse conversations. Really get to know the story of that person in front of you. It may seem fantastic. And two, stop boxing yourself in. You don't belong in a box. You have a history. Embrace it in all its beauty. But you also have the power to create your story moving forward. Don't let others place limitations on you based on which box they think you should check. 
you create your story. It's time we all flew beyond these boxes together. It's time to stretch our horizons. Thank you. <laughs>